Uh, 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 thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, so to stand your time out, you're just a bit of block phrase. Um, so I have these, I guess everyone can see my mouse and like I said, yeah, I have these images um, on, on the screen. So these are um, objects known as periodic graphs and associated to them uh, with some kind of operator. We're going to end up getting uh, some kind of uh, polynomial uh, from our operator act on these graphs, and it's going to give us uh, varieties. We, uh, one thing we might, uh, well, it's kind of hard to tell since this one zoomed in, but these are actually the same graph, but we have this um, different highlighted region that uh, really it's, it's these vectors that represent some choice of periodicity on our graph, and we're going to talk about how uh, the block variety of uh, choosing these different periodicities on the same graph, uh, uh, how uh, these relate to one another. And this is uh, based off of joint work with Jordi Lopez. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, oops. Okay, there it goes. Uh, so some I guess, motivation for why we're saying this, uh, uh, studying these uh, varieties and particularly um, irreducibility and other algebraic properties of these varieties goes back to the 1990s um, with uh, a book by Giesker, Kroner, and Tribowitz called, um, I just had it with me on the other desk, um, the, the uh, Algebraic Fermi Curves. Okay, that's um, where they not, not just studied, I guess, um, they reduced some of these varieties, but um, other properties such as uh, similarity types, but uh, they focused on uh, 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 varieties uh, associated to uh, this graph and different choices of periodicity. Uh, on top of this graph, uh, don't worry, I'll define things uh, tr tr uh, shortly. Um, recently, though, there's been a resurgence in wanting to study uh, irreducibility of these varieties. Uh, Julia Liu uh, generalized with uh, Giesker, Kroner, and Tribowitz, uh, Tribowitz, sorry, uh, Tribowitz did um, to higher dimensional graphs. Um, the original work just focused on dimension two and three, which is really the main dimensions that uh, the physicists care about anyway. Uh, and uh, for the most part, studying reducibility uh, or irreducibility or reducibility of block rays is, was somewhat esoteric, but recently you showed there is some physical mean to this. It relates to something called quantum irreducibility, which I'm not going to yes, go into. Uh, but they, uh, there's also recent work with uh, Film and Leomatos. They also studied similar graphs, but um, to the following graph shown, but you might have some additional um, edges. Everything has to be periodic with respect to uh, some base action. So let me actually define what I mean when I'm talking about these graphs. Uh, so a Z2, I'm just going to focus on the two dimensional case for the sake of this talk. Um, a Z2 periodic graph is a graph gamma uh, that has a free uh, Z2 action. So associated to it such that if we quotient the graph with that action, we're going to get finitely many vertices and finitely many um, edges. Uh, so this highlighted region is called the fundamental domain. When I say fundamental domain, oops, I'm uh, going to be specifically referring though to the um, edges. Or, sorry, 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 opposite to the vertices. Uh, so the uh, vertex orbits with respect to this uh, Z2 action. Uh, so I guess we, we, we might notice any vertex uh, that's shown here can be obtained by these uh, by translating that vertex by these vectors, which are the generators of our Z2 action. Uh, so I guess if we want to get here, for example, we would take uh, that we could start with this vertex, translate it by uh, this vector here, and then translate it by this vector here. And uh, we can uh, do this uh, with any vertex. It's probably a little bit easier to see over in this graph since we have, I guess, nice well, perpend. Uh, particular generators in, in this case, um, right, uh, this vertex associates this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, um, and so on. Uh, and the operator we're interested in look, looking at that acts on uh, functions that take uh, well, with domain given by the vertices of this graph is the Schrodinger operator. So this is just a, uh, the Schrodinger operator is a potential plus um, a weighted Laplacian. Uh, so our, our potential is just some um, uh, uh, function that's periodic with respect to our Z2 action um, that sends vertices to real values. Uh, we have an edge weight function C that sends um, edges to real values. And um, it's 
the operator is defined by how it um, acts on our functions at a particular uh, vertex of the graph. So it's going to um, L acting on F at a vertex U, it's going to send um, F to uh, the potential at U times uh, F of U, plus uh, we're going to sum over all of the neighbors of vertex U. So if here's U, we're, we're then going to sum over all of its adjacencies. And we're going to take the difference of F of U and F of V and scale that difference by the edge weight. Uh, so if, if C, for example, was one on every edge, that would just be the standard graph of Poisson if um, people are uh, familiar with that. Uh, really, this operator acts on all functions that are uh, take domain on uh, vertices of gamma, but we're going to focus on um, uh, square sumable functions uh, on the vertices of gamma. Oh, sorry. Um, OK, I, I did say the paragraph scale. OK, good. Um, so right now, this is uh, this, this operator. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be indexed by all possible values that F could take at every different vertex. So we have this infinite dimensional thing. Um, we can't really do much with that. So we're going to want to, but we have this uh, periodicity with respect to the group. Uh, so we're going to take a uh, Fourier transform uh, with respect to uh, the the, uh, the underlying uh, uh, peri uh, the underlying uh, group that our graph is peri periodic to. Um, and Mathematical physics is usually called a flow key transform, but it's it's just, just a Fourier transform. Uh, so F's going to get sent to F hat, and this is going to allow us um, that if we choose a fundamental domain, as in representative uh, vertex orbits, uh, we're only going to have to worry about the values that our uh, function takes at vertices of that fundamental domain, because we're going to be able to express um, every vertex can be expressed as a vertex in our fundamental domain, plus some translation. Um, as we talked about uh, briefly uh, before. And because of that, uh, F acting on any vertex is going to get uh, just sent to some monomial scalar based off the tra translation uh, at times the value F takes, uh, well, sorry, F, F hat takes at a vertex U. Uh, so this is going to, uh, after we apply this uh, flow key transform and look at our operator, uh, we more or less get this the same thing, except now. We can express everything just in terms of, of the values that hat takes at vertices of our fundamental domain. Um, so uh, we still have the the, the uh, our Schrodinger operator is still a potential times f hat of u, uh, but now uh, we could, we can always assume u and uh, we always assume uh, u and v in this case are vertices of the fundamental domain. Um, so this is going to allow us to represent our operator as a uh, finite matrix where our entries are going to be uh, Laurent polynomials. Uh, and in particular, this transform is going to uh, is an isomorphism from square ensemble functions on the vertices to square integrable functions on the torus. Uh, that And uh, which takes values on C to W by C to W, just uh, functions on vertices of the fundamental domain uh, with uh, these complex coefficients. OK, um, let's. Do an example since uh, that uh, might have been quite a bit. So let's look at um, how L of a few is going to act on uh, the following graph. So here we have uh, just labeled the vertices of our fundamental domain, U and V. Um, our edge weights are given by um, alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, so our operator is going to act on F at the vertex U. By first, uh, we just have the potential at U times the tau of U. And then we're going to go over that weighted Laplacian part. So U is adjacent to V. So we have F hat of U minus F hat of V. The edge between them is alpha. So we scale that difference by alpha. Uh, similarly, U is adjacent to this vertex here, which is V translated by minus A sub X, which is the vector one zero. So we have uh, F of U uh, minus X inverse F of V. So this X inverse is coming from uh, pulling out this minus one comma zero, and then we scale this difference by beta, and we just continue in that fashion, and we end up with the following. Uh, so under after this transform, our operator uh, is just multiplication by uh, some finite uh, some finite matrix. In, in this particular example, is just the two by two matrix. In general, your matrix will be uh, given by uh, it'll be. Uh, 
is m by m, where m is the number of vertices in your fundamental domain. Um, so the block variety that um, I uh, mentioned before is just the vanishing set of the characteristic polynomial of uh, this uh, finite matrix. So and this is a uh, variety and uh, c star uh, squared cross c. So just uh, c, remove the zeros, uh, squared cross c. So um, x and y uh, can be anything as long as they're not zero. For instance, when we're in the when we're dealing with the uh, Laurent polynomials, we want to be able to define x inverse, y inverse. Uh, and as with most uh, uh, varieties, our block variety will be irreducible whenever our characteristic polynomial is uh, some irreducible uh, polynomial to uh, some power. Um, and really, this should be uh, where n in this case should be an integer. Um, OK. Yeah, OK. And let me, I think, then, uh, next, uh, so just to get an idea of what uh, these block variables look, look like. Uh, oh, OK. Well, one thing I forgot, I forgot to mention. Uh, so we have this x inverse, y inverse here. So notice if we take the transpose and send x inverse, um, or send x to x inverse, send y to y inverse, our uh, matrix uh, uh, will get will recover our original matrix. Um, so in, in particular, when we restrict x and y to values on the torus or the uh, complex unit circle, our matrix is Hermitian, so we get real eigenvalues, which is why this picture is possible. Uh, when we restrict x and y uh, to the torus, our matrix is Hermitian, so our eigenvalues are real. So we're able to actually get a nice uh, picture of our uh, block variety. And um, in particular, if we take this block variety and we project it onto the uh, lambda coordinate, this recovers the spectrum of the operator, which is one of the uh, uh, main uh, ob objects that are studied by uh, spectral, th uh, spectral theorists who are interested in these type of problems. Um, and usually, the mathematical physicists uh, won't even consider this larger complex space. They just want to look at this block variety as an analytic variety on um, uh, particularly like in, in, in this space that we're looking at right now. Uh, okay. So I mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, now that we've defined subjects, I was uh, mentioning we want to study what, uh, what happens when we uh, look at uh, two characters, uh, multiple characteristic uh, polynomials coming from operators looking um, after imposing different periodicities on our graph. Uh, and it, it might have been, I guess, uh, probably uh, before it was not trivial why these would be different because it's it's the same graph. Um, however, uh, now that we've defined your operator in this, this transform, uh, this uh, our characteristic polynomial under this the original Z2 periodicity, that's just going to give us a two by two matrix. After we impose uh, that after we change the periodicity of this graph, we get a we get 12 vertices in our fundamental means. Now we have a 12 by 12 matrix. So these have to inherently be different characters of uh, polynomials. Uh, I'm going to refer to uh, going from uh, this original fundamental domain to this other fundamental domain under this uh, different view of uh, periodicity of the graph as a expansion of fundamental, fundamental domain. Because all, I, all we're really doing is we start with the Z2 action. Uh, since it's periodic with respect to that Z2 action, uh, our graph's also going to be periodic with respect to any uh, finite index uh, subgroup of our uh, original uh, uh, free group. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, we, yeah, we, we can alternatively view the graph as uh, periodic with respect to that subgroup action. Uh, and in order to distinguish uh, these two, because really I'm just going to be studying the uh, the actual characteristic polynomial itself. Uh, when I want to talk about the characteristic polynomial I, uh, we get from the Schrodinger operator acting on uh, this larger fundamental domain, I'm going to refer to it as P sub AB. So this is just the original graph viewed with uh, periodicity uh, AZ cross BZ rather than uh, Z squared. And uh, if we fix a, uh, one of our first results is if we fix a Z2 periodic potential. Uh, so uh, here we only have two possible potential values since our potential is periodic. It's going to be determined just by our, ver our the vertices in the fundamental domain. Um, if we maintain that periodicity, so we only have two potentials defined here. So the, every uh, these three vertices, or sorry, these six vertices all share the same potential. Um, and these six vertices all share the same potential. 
Uh, then as long as our original characteristic polynomial uh, satisfies some support condition with respect to our choice of A and B, we can conclude that phi uh, sub AB is going to be irreducible. And uh, so this is a special case of our, our result, but uh, oops, one thing I guess I want to emphasize is if, since we're going to, we'll, we'll use this later, if X and Y are terms of phi, then phi sub AB is going to be irreducible for any choice of expansion. Um, so it's kind of a strong condition since um, I have 12 vertices in my fundamental domain in this uh, for this particular example, but I've I've um, specialized their, their potentials and um, I've, I've restricted their potentials quite a bit. We have, there's only two possible potential values, but a uh, general potential uh, with respect to this funnel, uh, with respect to this uh, periodicity um, could take on 12 different values at the various vertices of our graph. Uh, so we want to try to see if uh, we can use uh, something similar where we uh, um, are able to just look at our original characteristic polynomial and then obtain information about um, this larger characteristic polynomial, but for a general potential um, in the in the larger uh, that's periodic with respect to the subgroup rather than the uh, original group. So in order to do that, we're going to uh, use uh, discrete uh, discrete geometry uh, to uh, study uh, our uh, phi sub AB. Um, so sorry, I uh, skipped ahead, but we're going to uh, particularly look at um, the Newton polytope of our uh, uh, of our characters to polynomial. So uh, this is just the uh, matrix from before from the uh, hexagonal lattice. Uh, so the, the the Newton polytope of the characteristic polynomial of uh, this particular matrix here um, is the uh, following pyramid. Uh, so we have lambda squared since we'd have like minus lambda here, minus lambda here. Uh, so this corresponds to this uh, this apex of, of the pyramid. We have an x. Uh, so we get these twins. Oh, wait, I should say okay. Uh, the Newton polytope just comes from uh, you have a polynomial, you take its exponent vectors. And then you take the convex hull of its, of its exponent vectors. Um, so really, this is the point zero zero two. I'm just labeling it lambda squared since it's coming from uh, the monomial lambda squared. Um, X corresponds to the point one zero zero. Y corresponds to the point zero one zero. Uh, and if we were to go over the other monomial terms, we would get uh, this following appearance is just a uh, pyramid of height two with some hexagonal base. Um, so I guess. Uh, and the, the other thing we need to uh, find is uh, a facial polynomial. So, uh, if you take some kind of um, uh, inner normal weighted, weighted vector and you look at uh, the exponent vectors that are minimized by that inner integer vector, you get something that you, you get a face of that polytope. If you restrict the monomials that occur on that face um, for the polynomial, you get the facial polynomial with respect to that face. So in this case, uh, uh, our face is just uh, this triangle. The monomials lambda squared x and y occur on this face. Um, so we uh, extract those terms while keeping their coefficients consistent. And that is, that's the facial polynomial of phi with respect to um, f. Uh, oftentimes, this is, uh, you might be familiar with, like uh, I think these are you just call the initial forms. And rather than doing like phi sub f, you would do a phi sub omega with respect to some um, inner normal vector. Um, this is just to simplify that slightly. Okay, uh, so why are we looking at polytopes? Well, uh, in the case when our potential is uh, Z2 periodic, there's a very nice uh, correspondence between uh, the Newton polytope of phi and the Newton polytope of uh, the expanded characteristic polynomial uh, phi sub AB. Um, in particular, it's just a linear map where uh, the first coordinate gets uh, uh, is multiplied by b, second coordinate gets multiplied by a, the third coordinate gets multiplied by a times b. So our original pyramid, pyramid we had lambda squared xy, um, x gets sent to um, x squared, y gets sent to y cubed, and lambda gets sent to uh, lambda 12 or point by 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, And uh, so that this this might may not be the case in 
in general, but this is the case when it's Z2 periodic. And um, oftentimes, even when your potential is not Z2 periodic, you can show that this still happens, um, which is one of the uh, main main things we end up doing. But um, so why do I introduce polyoptic token first list? So there's a, uh, oops, OK, I'm not, I'm not there. OK, sorry. <laughs> um, Mikowski, uh, some. So OK, so polytopes have this natural um, addition operator on it uh, called the uh, Mikowski sum. Uh, you can just view it as uh, take two polytopes and then take the uh, pointwise uh, and then uh, the, their Mikowski sum is just uh, what you obtain by um, summing all uh, vertices of one polytope with all the vertices of the other polytope. You can also um, view it as, uh, so we have this triangle here. Uh, if we were to take this triangle and uh, just kind of place it right on top of this square here, and then slowly move it over, right? You get that, that box there. You have this edge here where the triangle stops here. And then you just kind of like keep going around your shape. That's, that's one, one way you can uh, you obtain it. I didn't really give a rigorous definition. This is actually not really the definition of uh, Mikowski sum, um, but Mikowski sum do have this nice property where um, if I take the Newton polytope of a function f, I sum that type of Mikowski sum of that Newton polytope with a Newton polytope um, of some polynomial g. Um, that's going to equal the Newton polytope of the product of those two polynomials. I don't know why I listed this as a definition, but uh, uh, these, uh, so yeah, uh, in, in the, the case of this example, this uh, triangle here could be given by, for example, x plus y squared plus x. Um, this square could be x plus x plus y plus xy. And these are just specific polynomials, but they, they don't have to be. Just any polynomial with these supports would do. Um, then fg um, is going to be uh, the following polynomial, which has Newton polytope of this uh, nice polygon we see here. Okay. So the whole reason I, I did this was so we could introduce um, in decomposability. So a Newton polytope is said to be in decomposable if it cannot be written as anything except uh, possibly a sum of two scalar copies of itself. Uh, so for example, any triangle could only ever be written as a sum of two smaller similar triangles. Um, so similarly, a pyramid can only ever be written uh, as a Mikowski sum of two smaller uh, similar pyramids. They, I, it just has to be that pyramid times maybe like uh, some rational number. That's the, that's the only way it can possibly uh, uh, be decomposed. Uh, so we don't directly use indecomposability, but we use a slight relaxation of indecomposability uh, called that, which we call uh, only homothetically reducible. So this is more or less indecomposability, but weakened to just apply to polynomials. So uh, we say a polynomial f is only homothetically reducible if uh, f uh, equal to, if uh, we could write f as g times h, then this implies that uh, both uh, g, uh, the Newton polytope of g and the Newton polytope of h have to be scalar copies of Newton polytope of f. Possibly one of the scalar copies could be uh, times uh, zero. So uh, like it, it could correspond to a point, for example, if like f is um, ir irreducible. So I guess technically I should say that Ng or Nh are scalar copies. Uh, that's that's how I actually have to find, but I uh, made a slight mistake there. Um, but uh, the, the nice, uh, I guess the, the, the reason we need to introduce this um, definition, so um, if uh, the Newton polytope of F is indecomposable, uh, then just by definition of indecomposability, that implies F has to be only homothetically uh, reducible. Similarly, if F is irreducible, uh, F has to then be only homothetically reducible, so, uh, since I mean, it's, it would if whenever it's written as a product, right, it's it's itself times a point. So one of them is homothetic to the original polytope. Um, but this also includes uh, polynomials with Newton polytopes that are neither uh, that are not indecomposable and f's uh, are, and polynomials f that are not irreducible. So um, the example I have here is uh, f is equal to one minus two x minus two y minus two xy, and we uh, take this uh, squared. So uh, this the polytope of f is a square. This is not inde indecomposable because uh, because uh, a square can always be um, written as a Mikowski sum of just uh, two line segments. So some, uh, I guess, uh, vertical line segments, some horizontal line segment. Um, you can always uh, write a square uh, as a Mikowski sum of uh, those those two vectors. Oh, sorry, sorry, those those two uh, segments. Uh, However, in the case of this particular uh, polynomial, because 1 minus 2x minus 2y minus 2xy is irreducible, um, if uh, 
Well, when f factors, it has to factor as um, two smaller squares. So the uh, actual uh, polytope of f factors are homothetic to the Newton polytope of f. Um, and so the, the whole reason we're, we're looking at it is it turns out for um, our characteristic polynomials and also for the uh, facial polynomials of our original uh, characteristic polynomial when our potential is periodic. Um, if the original characteristic polynomial is only homothetically reducible, then our expanded uh, characteristic polynomial has to also be only homothetically uh, re reducible. And sim similarly, if one of the faces is only homothetically irreducible, then the corresponding face of face of AB has to be only homothetically reducible. Okay. Um, so uh, there's this result from Shepard uh, back in the 60s that uh, shows given, uh, well, guess, uh, let me just do this first, this definition. So uh, uh, given the polytope, we say that a strong chain of faces is just a sequence of faces such that any two consecutive elements um, in the sequence um, have to share at least an edge. So for example, on this uh, pyramid here, if we take uh, two adjacent triangular facets, they share an edge. So the so any two adjacent triangular faces would give us a strong chain of uh, two faces. Similarly, we could go, I guess all, uh, we just keep going all the way around uh, with uh, these adjacent triangles that would give us a strong chain of uh, faces. And, um, uh, Shepard showed in uh, 1963. Uh, well, this is this is a somewhat weakened statement of, his, or it's uh, I guess a somewhat specific statement of his actual result. What he actually stated is somewhat more general. But if all vertices of your polytope can be covered by a strong chain of indecomposable faces, then the polytope itself is indecomposable. Uh, so, so uh, I, I guess I, I claimed before that this pyramid was indecomposable. But uh, if you believe me, at least that a triangle is indecomposable, uh, then Shepard gives us a proof as to why any pyramid is going to end up being indecomposable because we're going to end up with um, all of our two faces, our, well, which just means our two dimensional faces in this case, um, uh, besides this base here, uh, all, uh, these, these triangles are two faces. They form a chain around, around uh, our pyramid. Um, they all share at least an edge. So they, they satisfy the condition of being a strong chain. And um, since each triangle is indecomposable, the entire pyramid has to be uh, indie uh, indie composable. And you, you notice that we we do have this, uh, we do have the the base of this pyramid, which might not be in indie composable. We don't have to worry about that since uh, vertices. Uh, I should have defined vertices. Vertices are just um, the points on um, on the outside of our noon uh, polytope, or just zero dimensional faces. Uh, but every zero dimensional face occurs uh, in this chain of triangles. Uh, so. Uh, Shepard's theorem satisfied, and we can conclude pyramids are indecomposable. Uh, what we end up doing is uh, we we realize that this this result can be uh, uh, used similarly for um, only homothetically reducible polynomials. Uh, so more or less, the proof is I, I believe more or less I, I identical. But um, if you start with f as a uh, the wrong polynomial. Um, if all of your vertices of your Newton polytope be covered by a strong chain of faces, such that your facial polynomials are only homothetically reducible, then your uh, polynomial F itself has to be only homothetically re reducible. Um, so, uh, I the uh, thing here is uh, again, like the Newton polytope of F need not be indeed in decomposable. You, you could have square. Uh, uh, faces that actually uh, necessarily do decompose, but if you know some more information about the uh, about the actual poly polynomial, um, you can still more or less get something uh, close enough to indecomposability. Well, at, at least in terms of the uh, polynomial, that is. Uh, so the, the reason we uh, in introduce this is because uh, since we want to study these uh, general potentials, just because um, the characteristic equation e sub a b might be uh, uh, dependent on well, this, uh, like um, on all these uh, general potentials, doesn't mean the faces are. Uh, so the the faces are of um, piece maybe or the, the uh, facial polynomials. The potential might not show up there, and therefore those faces will be equivalent to some Z two periodic potential of facial pol pol polynomial, which is going to allow us to use our result 
um, in the uh, uh, case where our potential um, is Z2 periodic. So um, in, in particular, if we just treat our, our potential values as free variables, so um, in, in the case we saw before, we had we we're taking a three by two um, expansion. So we had uh, of that uh, hexagonal lattice, which is originally in two vertices. So we have 12 uh, free parameters. If none of those show up um, on our facial polynomial at infinity, uh, we can say that our facial polynomial is uh, potential independent. And um, because in the Z2 periodic case, uh, if our original polynomial is, oh, yeah, okay. This is slightly off. Um, it should say any potential independent phi sub AB sub F is homothetically reducible if phi sub F is homothetically, is only homothetically reducible. Um, we don't just get this for, for free. We, we, we do need uh, the facial polynomial before the expansion to also be only homothetically reducible. And then, then this will extend. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't mention before, uh, I, I gave this previous theorem on um, implications of, uh, of uh, what, I guess, our, how uh, our original characteristic polynomial implies something about this expanded uh, characteristic polynomial. Uh, well, this, this also applies to a uh, facial uh, polynomials. So uh, if the support of uh, a facial polynomial of uh, phi uh, contains the monomials x and y, um, and uh, phi sub ab comma f is, uh, so the expanded facial polynomial of that same face, because uh, remember we have, have uh, that linear map between faces if uh, things are C2 periodic, which potential independence gives us. So uh, if we have x and y in the support of phi sub f, and our expanded uh, facial polynomial is um, potential independent, then um, that facial poly the facial polynomial of phi sub AB has to be irreducible for any choice of A and B. Uh, so this is a pretty specific case, but the reason why this is uh, if we go back to our writing example, uh, we end up with that exactly. We have that lambda squared X and Y uh, base from uh, before. Uh, one can show that every face um, for phi sub AB, um, except uh, the, the base of the polytope, is going to be potential and independent. So we get that every face of uh, phi sub AB, um, yeah, well, I guess I have every uh, facet that contains the apex um, is going to have that only homothetically reducible property, which implies phi sub AB itself has to be only homothetically reducible. Um, and then all we're left to do is show that there is a single irreducible face which since we have this face here that contains those terms X and Y, um, and we have potential independence of that same face, we have by the uh, previous uh, uh, restatement of the first theorem I, I gave that the facial polynomial uh, phi sub AB of F actually has to be irreducible, and therefore uh, phi sub AB itself has to be irreducible. Uh, and uh, because it's and potential independence uh, means that the, the potential really doesn't affect whether this polynomial is irreducible at all. So no matter the choice of our potential with respect to this, uh, uh, this uh, like this, uh, subgroup periodicity that we've uh, chosen, uh, we're going to get uh, our block variety is going it will be irreducible. Well, really the characteristic polynomial will be irreducible and therefore the block variety has to be irreducible. Um, okay. Uh, so I didn't guess go into details for, for these, but uh, you can do this for other lattices as, as well. So uh, here's the dice lattice. I should have, I guess, given the actual uh, vectors, but uh, this is periodic with respect uh, to, uh, well, I guess if you guys, uh, if you want, if you all could follow my mouse, this is uh, my, my, my uh, generating vectors would be, uh, so this for text to uh, this for text would be one generating translation, and this for text to this for text would be another generating translation. So this is this lattice here. We actually were to uh, keep tiling it and or keep, uh, I guess, repeating it in that periodic pattern is called the uh, di dice lattice. Um, so in the case of the dice lattice, for all of all potentials, we don't necessarily have that it's irreducible, but we can show that if it does reduce, it uh, has to be uh, um, a single. There's going to be a single irreducible hypersurface, and then there's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, things that there's going to be uh, at most a times b uh, flat band. So by uh, this is what the, uh, the this is called, but a uh, flat band is just 
if you I guess go back to our, our spectrum picture, it would be just uh, something that's just flat with uh, respect to lambda. So like no matter your x and y value, you get the uh, set the same value. Um, equivalently, in terms of the actual polynomial, this just corresponds to our characteristic polynomial having a um, linear factor in lambda. So maybe like lambda lambda minus d, for example, divides our characteristic polynomial. Uh, but we're able to show that um, uh, b sub a b uh, uh, is uh, uh, the, the only way it could possibly factor is uh, by uh, linear factors and then some, uh, times some irreducible ball polynomial. Um, then uh, yeah, I guess, uh, another, another example we look at is um, uh, dense uh, peri periodic, periodic graphs. So a, a dense graph is just uh, defined as follows. So you fix some fundamental, some fundamental domain. Um, it should have uh, your fundamental domain should form a complete graph um, if you restrict to it. So right here we just have two vertices. So just one edge between them gives us a complete graph on uh, two vertices. Um, then if that fundamental domain is adjacent to another fundamental domain, so for example. Um, this fundamental domain is adjacent, uh, shares an edge with this translate ver uh, copy of it. Um, if there's one edge, we should have all possible edges between them. So if we um, just take uh, the vertices, I guess, of uh, this fundamental domain and the transit fundamental, fundamental domain, we ignore the internal edges. We should have a complete bipartite graph between um, uh, those translate copies of the fundamental domain. So this is this is an, an example of a dense graph in two dimension. Um, this is kind of ugly, but this is an example of a dense graph in three dimensions. Um, you can see we have the same. Uh, the 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 blue edges here are the uh, uh, would be I guess the uh, edge orbit re representatives. The purple ver ver uh, vertices here are the uh, vertex orbit representatives. Um, uh, so these form a fun uh, together. They form a uh, funnel domain. Um, but uh, one thing we were able to show is that uh, the, um, if for any dense graph, your uh, block ready is going to be irreducible for uh, all potentials for infinitely many uh, A, B expansions. This is because um, if your graph is dense, you automatically get this potential independence of your faces uh, when you take uh, when you look at the expanded uh, characteristic poly polynomial. Um, in, in the case of these two specific graphs that we're, we're looking at, uh, Irreducibility um, extends for um, generic. If, if we um, take a generic uh, edge labeling um, of our of our graph, then um, irreducibility uh, irreducibly will, ex will extend always. And this this follows um, from some uh, from work I did with uh, Frank Frank Tilly, uh, but before this paper that uh, where we showed that um, if you have a have a dense graph, the facial polynomials uh, Necessarily have to be uh, non-singular when you take a generic choice of ed edge weights, uh, and that therefore uh, it has to also. But therefore, those facial polynomials also have to be ir irreducible. Um, but maybe I shouldn't have gone into that. Sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, more, I, I guess I'm. I'm uh, well, uh, so they, these are some specific examples that I was trying to limit to, uh, to the two-dimensional case. But uh, what we do in this work works for any dimension. Um, if you're, you're interested, our uh, uh, the uh, preprint of the paper is available on the archive. Uh, but otherwise, um, thank you all uh, so much uh, for uh, listening. Thank you very much. Yes, let's thank the speaker. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I have a couple of somewhat random questions. Uh, okay, so uh, just a quick question about your. Uh, Modification of Shepard's theorem, where you replace the um, like the strong chain with the only hypothetically reducible thing. Oh. Um, <laughs> like how far away is the converse from being true? Oh, the uh, the converse. Oh, if it's only hypothetically reducible, then all the faces have to be. Um, a good question. Um. Hmm. I I haven't thought thought about that. It's only okay. I need to show that okay. one direction, but uh, it might be from the other direction. Um, is why why wouldn't it be? Uh, 
No, okay, okay. No, no, it should be possible for the thesis to still reduce, but something about your polynomial makes it so you still have it has to factor homothetically, maybe through like because the, the, the I, um I, I haven't thought about 100 percent so I could could be wrong here, but I, part of me has to uh, is assuming that you could have something going on with coefficients inside um your polytope that you won't necessarily see at infinity that might still okay. enforce the only homothetically reducible condition but doesn't necessarily extend to the faces. So um, I, could, I, I, I could be wrong here, but I, I, that would be, I think, very nice if you could show that, but that's, that's okay. why I'm skeptical. Sorry. I see, it's okay. Um, so another slightly more random question is, um, so a Schrodinger operator, when you have a Z2 periodic graph, it specializes to just a graph of question, just to check. Oh, can you say that one more time? Sorry, I missed. So the Schrodinger operator you mentioned at the beginning, when you have a Z2 periodic graph, it just specializes to a graph of Uh, yes. Uh, so okay. uh, if, if uh the if you choose your weights to just just be one for every edge, and you oh. make your potential zero, that's just the standard graph of Okay. So just a silly random question is um, can you say anything about generalization for chip firing? Of of uh, what uh to Chip, the last part, Chip right? uh, I guess I'm actually not not familiar with that. Oh okay, that, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I just mentioned it since it just seems vaguely dynamic when there's some kind of division process, but it's okay. Oh okay. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Well, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. I might then uh, stop the recording at least.